Margot Schlanger, professor from the University of Michigan Law School, um, a very, very well-regarded leading scholar in fields of immigration and civil rights, also a former uh, public servant in the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. Thank you very much. It's really a great privilege to be here um, and uh, to talk with you all about a current fight that we're having in the immigration arena to bring civil rights values into the immigration arena, which is a fight that we're having on a bunch of fronts, and I'm going to talk about two of them. I, um, I too, want to I, I want to start with some words of Justice Jackson, which come from the Korematsu dissent that he wrote. I actually don't. It's not so much that I care. I'm, I'm going to decontextualize them a little bit. He was talking about. Um, judicial opinions that ratify military orders. And he, and he, he said this in dissent. He said, once a judicial, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to apply this in a, in a slightly broader way. Once a judicial opinion rationalizes an order to show that it conforms to the Constitution, or rather rationalizes the Constitution to show that the Constitution sanctions such an order, the court for all time has validated the principle of racial discrimination in criminal procedure and of transplanting American citizens. Let me just say that again. Has validated the principle of racial discrimination in criminal procedure and the idea of racial discrimination in transplanting American citizens. The principle then lies around like a loaded weapon ready for the hand of any authority that can bring forward a plausible claim of an urgent need. Every repetition embeds the principle more deeply in our law and thinking and expands it to new purposes. So what I want to do is think about that in the purposes and the principles that have underlay our immigration constitutional law and think about what kind of loaded guns have we created as a constitutional matter and what use are those loaded guns being put to now. So that's what I'm planning to do, and I'm going to do that by talking about two cases um, uh, and some general things as well. The, the travel ban case and a much less famous case, one that's going on right now, and some of you may have seen me like being a little bit compulsive on my email the past couple days. That's because I'm litigating a case that we won a, we won a, a TRO, a temporary restraining order, last night, and we're going back to the court today to ask him to expand it, and I'm here, and um, it's causing me a little bit of anxiety. So forgive me, but I'm gonna I'm gonna assuage that anxiety by telling you all about it a little bit. So um, before I get to that, let me let me say that I, I used to work at the Department of Homeland Security. I was in the early Obama administration. The um, what's called the Officer for Civil Rights and Civil Liberties in the Department of Homeland Security. And so I thought a lot in that context about what kinds of civil rights values the government ought its own self to apply to its own activities in a realm, immigration, national security, right, in a realm in which the government is quite undersupervised by the courts. And so I thought a lot about I'm working I'm, I'm working for the first, you know, the first constitutional law professor who's become the president, right? I'm working for the first black president. I'm thinking about what does civil rights look like on the inside? And so after a, a lot of discussion and thinking, and I, I, I do teach constitutional law, and I've been a civil rights lawyer for a pretty long time, Joyce and I discovered that we, we worked together on a, a matter a really long time ago, um, an affirmative civil rights matter in, the, in, in um, Alabama. Um, we distilled it down to three ideas, that the, the civil rights inside the government needed to be about three ideas, and those ideas are equality, liberty, and fairness. And so we thought a lot about those are the, those are the pole stars, those are, those are the, guiding, the guiding ideas. I, I actually said to my, my colleagues and my staff a lot that we were not the office of niceness, um, that we had to have something a little bit more than just being nice. We had to have a little more content, and that those were the contents, equality, liberty, fairness. So I'm going to come back to that in a minute, because when I left government and got back out, and then particularly in this administration, which seems to not really care very much about equality, liberty, and fairness um, for many, many, many parts of the American community, 
I, I keep thinking about how can we make those the touchstone values of the immigration system as well as of other things. All right, so with that as the introduction, let me say this. You heard a terrific guide this morning from, from Lucas Gutentag about how at the very birth of the constitutional regulation or non-regulation, the, the, the decision not to regulate the immigration system, um, that at the very birth of what's called the plenary power doctrine was racism, that that was present at the founding, right? And we have to remember that. So the Che Chan Ping case, the Chinese exclusion case that he talked about, you know, it, it reached a, a, a racially problematic result but Lucas didn't read to you some of the language in that case, which was not just ratifying racism, not just saying, okay, you know, Congress may do, you know, it didn't do that. It actually entirely partook of that racism. The court in that decision in 1889 talked about Chinese immigrants as hordes, as hordes of people threatening to overrun the United States. It was a, an animalistic, kind of a set of um, tropes that is very familiar to anybody who has looked at American history and how, how we in our racist history talk about Asians in particular, right? So they are strangers among us. Um, here's another uh, similar in era phrase. This is from, um, wait, where did I put it? Shoot. Yeah, here it is. This is from another case that's at, at a similar time, United States versus Wong Kim Ark. This one actually came out a different way. It said, no, 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 when people are born here, even if their parents are Chinese, they, they still get to be American. But I want you to hear the dissent in that language because it's really important to kind of understanding. The dissent didn't have any success in that particular opinion, but the dissent was really important in the immigration context. Um, as characterizing the way that the courts thought about the Chinese in particular. Um, what Justice Fuller wrote, joined by Justice Harlan, who you remember is the, the, the guy who's in favor of the colorblind constitution, right? Justice Harlan, the civil rights hero, right? Okay, so this is Fuller joined by Harlan. And what he writes is that the Chinese who, who live here, that the Chinese are a distinct race and religion, remaining strangers in the land, residing apart by themselves, tenaciously adhering to the usages and customs of their own country, um, unfamiliar with our institutions, and apparently incapable of assimilating with our people. And so that idea about what happens with particular groups of immigrants, that they are incapable of becoming American, Right? Even in Plessy itself, when Harlan writes much the same thing, although not quite as explicitly, when he talks about how it's okay for the Chinese to be a different race, to never become citizens, right? Even it, and that's in, in the paradigm case, the, the, the case that is the beacon of the, of the idea that white supremacism shouldn't be reflected in the Constitution. That case contains in it this idea that immigration is different and that the Chinese are different, right? Those two ideas. And so at, as we've watched, well, let me, let, me, let me not get to the end of that. Let me say one other thing about what's at the foundation of the plenary power. At the foundation of the plenary power besides racism, which is key, is this idea about foreign policy. And I didn't bring any quotes to read to you about this, but I'll just tell you there's dozens of quotes about this, right? The plenary power is about foreign policy. So how can we govern? We can't govern the courts, say. We can't govern what the Congress does. We can't govern what the president does. They're regulating our interaction with foreign governments. It's just not, it's beyond the judicial ken, right? Those are the two core ideas. So I offer that to you. Those are the two core ideas, racism and foreign policy. Now, the racism idea becomes less and less and less attractive, right? We had a constitutional revolution since 1889. We've had, if not the end of white supremacism, not the end of white supremacism, we've had at least the end of the judicial 
explicit ratification of white supremacism in our constitutional doctrine, right? And that's happened over a period of time, and, and there's a lot of cases that contribute to that, and a movement that brought those cases, that t moved the courts towards that, um, towards that idea and ideal, and um, we have among us people who have been crucial in that movement, and I'm not going to talk about that. I'm just going to notice, nice work, right? The civil rights movement moved the doctrine in a way that really matters, right? And so, so the Chinese exclusion case becomes an embarrassment constitutionally. The, the, the frank racism that is at the core of the plenary power is no longer sufficient as a matter of constitutional order to support the plenary power. And the question is, what's going to substitute for it? And you might say, oh, I know, foreign policy. But the problem is that you've heard another talk today from Rick, who says immigration isn't about foreign policy anymore. That's not really what we talk about. And you heard from Lucas, who told us why. Because in 1965, the Congress passed a law that said we're not going to use the immigration law to do deals and pay special favors and negotiate with other governments. We're actually going to have an immigration system that has a, a norm of equality embedded in it. That's why Lucas said this morning that the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1965 is a civil rights statute because it serves one of those core three ideas that are the civil rights ideas which are equality, liberty, and fairness. So the INA commits us to an equality idea. Does it commit us wholesale? No. Not in every single way, but in a really important way. And that's a civil rights, light, it, it's a sea change. And so all of a sudden, we've got this equality idea in the immigration system. And the equality idea is not only consistent with what I just said about the Chinese exclusion case, right? This idea that, like, are you, are you kidding me? Like, the reason you're going to say that this is constitutional is because the Chinese stink? Right? Really? Like, are you kidding me? Right? But no longer can we say anymore either, oh, you know, it's all about, like, like individual negotiation and diplomacy with the individual countries, because we don't do that anymore for our immigration system. So what's going to support the plenary power doctrine? I offer to you that we've got basically nothing. There is basically nothing in support of the plenary power doctrine. Okay, pause for one moment. So, simultaneously with that, we've got this beginning of the use of the immigration system and immigration authorities, which you heard about from, um, from Joyce, to serve a public safety purpose, right? Really important move that people who write about it often call crimigration, right? This idea that immigration authorities are not being enforced as immigration authorities, they are ways to get at dangerous people. And I, I get it. I get it. I've participated in the same administration as Joyce did. I, I you know, been there. I, I get it. And it's not, it's not, there's, nothing nonsensical about that at all. But I just want you to notice that all of the things that support the constitutional doctrine about immigration, the deference that colors that constitutional doctrine, which are about racism and foreign policy, they don't actually support the idea that we can use immigration authority to do criminal justice work. If we're going to use immigration authorities to do criminal justice work, we need kind of a different theory of it all. And so, the new use of immigration authorities to do public safety criminal justice work is um, problematic in, in a, a world of constitutional doctrine. And let me just say one more thing about that, and then I'm 13 minutes in, then I'm going to move to the Muslim cases the, uh, and, and this Chaldean case too. What I mean by it being problematic is this. In general, we have an idea in our criminal justice work that you don't do group thinking in the world of criminal justice. It's one of the core commitments about equality and fairness, right? You don't go after particular kinds of people because other people like them are problematic, right? You don't say the Dominicans run really tough, the Dominican Americans run really tough like, like violent drug things, so I'm gonna target Dominican Americans for drug enforcement. You don't do that. You don't say, um, 
uh, Ni Nigerian Americans are fraudsters, so I'm going to target Nigerian Americans for fraud. You don't say that. You don't say that about groups. You don't say it about nationality groups, ethnic groups, racial groups, religious groups. You don't do that in criminal justice. And I don't mean to say that the Obama administration did that in the immigration world. I actually don't think they did. I think that what the Obama administration did was use immigration authorities to go after people they would have gone after anyway um, in, in many situations. So I, I'm not actually, I'm not, I, I see Joyce writing and I, I, I want to just be clear, I'm not attacking you. Okay, all right, all right, I want to just be clear, we're all among friends here, so. Um, but, but that said, crimigration is inconsistent. Crimigration is inconsistent with the basic structure of the plenary power doctrine. And I want to just point that out. Okay, so now we get to these two recent challenges. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about each one, and then I'm going to draw all those threads together, and then I'm going to sit down. Um, so throughout his campaign, President Trump talked over and over and over about a Muslim ban. He talked about how dangerous Islam was, and he talked about how there were a lot of bad people. And when, and when asked, do you mean all Muslims are bad? He said, well, maybe not all, but most, right? So he talked about a Muslim ban, and he talked about banning everybody who was Muslim from um, visiting or immigrating to this country. Um, and when he got attacked and told, but that's unconstitutional. Now pause for one second. Is that unconstitutional? It's actually no more racist than the Chinese exclusion case. Um, I think he's right. Well, he's not right, but I think it's true. It is unconstitutional. But that itself involves a, 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 a defeat of the norm of the Chinese exclusion case. But when told it was unconstitutional, he said, okay. And he goes to Rudy Giuliani, and he says to Giuliani, he says, show me how to do this the legal way. Now, maybe he was saying, show me how to put some window dressing on it so the courts will uphold it. I think that's probably what he was saying. Maybe he's saying, oh, you guys got me. I'm totally persuaded. My ideas were all wrong. Now I just want to accomplish my very worthwhile end, but do it in, right? Have you ever heard, all right, I'm just going to not even, right? I'm not, I, I just, I can't even. So maybe he did that, but I think what he probably did, what he probably did is he said to Giuliani, I've got this thing I want to do, and everybody's like fussing at me, and you be my, be, be my fixer. Show me how to do it a legal way. I want to still do the same thing. Show me how to do it a legal way. And so um, out of that comes the, the first executive order, the first travel ban. And that, what it does is it picks out seven countries, uh, Iran, Iraq, Yemen, Syria, Somalia, Sudan, Libya, all majority Muslim countries, not all the majority Muslim countries. There are countries not on that list, but all majority Muslim countries. Um, and it, it takes the nationals of those countries and it subjects them to uniquely disadvantageous treatment as both immigrants and visitors. And it does not exempt anybody, the first one, right? And you all watched it unfold at the airports, right? There's chaos at the airports and the ACLU makes a ton of money because everybody wants to do something and what they do is, all right, just kidding. So, um, so there's chaos at the airports and why is there chaos at the airports? Because there's no rollout and there's no exemptions and it covers everybody no matter how tight their connection to the United States is. It covers legal permanent residents. It covers people who were in school and went home on holiday and now they're back. It covers them without any warning. There were people who got on a plane, came to the United States. They were in status. They were valid to enter. They arrived at the gates at JFK and they were told that they were committing a crime. Their, their visas torn up and they were sent, well I don't actually know if they were sent home from JFK, but there were airports from which they were sent home. So Chaos ensues, and instantly the courts set in and enjoin it, right? And there's a couple of um, very dramatic days of litigation, which end, the, the executive order was passed on January 20, uh, was signed on January 27th, 2017, and on February 7th, the Ninth Circuit enters a full opinion saying, nope, we're going to consider it more slowly, but in this preliminary posture, no way it's enjoined, right? So at that, the president tweets, see you in court, which 
pause for one second, is not a very big threat against judges who, you know, they, right, who live in court, right? Okay, that sounds perfect. When's your brief coming? So, so he says, see you in court. But in fact, what the Justice Department does is they say, we change our mind. We're not going to defend that executive order. We're going to write a new one. The president's going to write a new one, and we'll defend the new one. And so they come back with a second executive order. It takes a full month before the president signs the second executive order. In the meantime, this first one, which he had said was super duper urgent to protect the United States from, you know, the, the marauders who are trying to get to us, like for a month, it stayed. And, you know, he could have had a second order in three days, right? It's not that long. But he doesn't. It takes a month. And a month later, he comes back with another executive order. And this executive order is much more careful. It doesn't touch all of the legal permanent residents. It has a phase-in period. It has a waiver process. And it leaves off a rack. I'm, I'm going to get to the leaving off a rack part, because that's setting the stage for my, the second case I want to tell you about. But it leaves off a rack. And, and it gets unrolled, and the White House says, OK, we're good now, right? And the courts say, no, I'm sorry, you're not good now. It's still a Muslim ban. The point of it, the purpose behind it, taints it. And the purpose of it is that it's a Muslim ban. And you can say all you want that Congress has given you in the Immigration and Nationality Act full authority to regulate and order the entry of aliens. You can say that all you want, but A, it's wrong under the INA. There's actually other provisions of the INA that undermine that claim, and B, it's wrong under the Constitution because it can't violate the Equal Protection Clause and the Free Exercise Clause or the Establishment Clause. And so you, the norm of equality, say the litigants, is, has come into the immigration system and governs it. Now, here's the point. The Trump administration does not defend by saying, no, you've got the foundational commitments of the immigration system wrong. They don't defend plenary power. They don't defend the idea that equality isn't part of the immigration system. They don't defend on the basis of the Chinese exclusion case. They defend by saying two things. One, no, that's not what it's about. It's actually a national security law that has really to do with the countries, not the religion. It's, it's just, you've got this wrong. It's not an anti-Muslim law uh, uh, order. And two, to the extent there's any evidence that it is an anti-Muslim order, the courts need to have a particular set of blinders on that forbid that evidence from being considered by the department, by, uh, by, the, by the judges. So they're not allowed to consider anything that happened before Inauguration Day, and they're not allowed to consider anything that um, isn't sort of a, a rising to a level of, a, a certain level of kind of officialness. Um, and so all that evidence of bias, of animus, is outside the range of what the courts can consider. OK, so those are the two claims. And the, so far, the Trump administration has lost on those claims. So in the Fourth Circuit, the Court of Appeals um, uh, that sits um, pertinently to this case in Maryland, um, the Fourth Circuit said, we don't think we have to have blinders on, and we think the administration's purpose was full, was, was dominated by animus. So it's no good for that reason. The Ninth Circuit says, we think that your assertion of, 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 of delegated authority from the Congress misunderstands the scheme that is the Immigration and Nationality Act, which embeds in it a commitment to equality that you are disregarding. And those are the two opinions that have happened so far at appellate levels, and they are now both pending before the Supreme Court. Okay, so that's the Muslim ban case. So what do we notice about that? We notice that neither of those, nobody is saying that equality is not part of the immigration system. Everybody agrees with that. That's a really interesting move, right? Really interesting move. And so I don't know what the court will do. I, I'm no good, I, like, I mean, it's, it's like predicting, it's all about, you know, Justice Kennedy, and I'm no better at predicting Justice Kennedy than anybody else is. So, um, so I don't know what the court will do, but I am hopeful that, and I should just, by, by way of full disclosure, I'm 
you know, one of a group of counsel in one of these cases, not in one of the two that I just talked about, but in a, a version of this that's being brought in Michigan. Um, so it's obvious what I think should happen, but I should just say that, that at least I find a hopeful message in the development of the immigration system that nobody is saying that equality is outside the norms that are at, that are crucial to be applied in the immigration system. That's actually the agreement in this case, and that is a notable development. All right, the second case, and I'll be very fast on this one, came out of that Iraq part. So how is it that the Trump administration left Iraq off the list and turned a seven country ban into a six country ban? The answer is they entered into a negotiation with Iraq where Iraq agreed to accept deportations from the United States of Iraqis, even including Iraqis who have been here many years, including Iraqis who have committed um, both minor and non-minor crimes. So um, on, the, and, and the administration did a little bit of uh, using that new availability of deportation to Iraq uh, in April and early May, but only a little bit. They deported eight people. But, and then in June, on June 11th, uh, around the country, ICE went out and arrested what seems to be, have been about 200 um, Iraqis, including many who had been here for decades, um, whose deportation, who, who had final orders of removal from a long, long time ago, but who had not been able to be deported because uh, Iraq wouldn't accept them in prior years. 114 of them are from my community of Metro Detroit. And the... Um, a lawsuit ensued, and last night the um, district court granted a 14-day pause while he figures out some very complex jurisdictional questions, which I am not going to talk about here. Um, but what I want to just tell you about for two more minutes, and then I will subside, is that the claim of this lawsuit is about the other one, remember, equality, liberty, and fairness, um, uh, I'm going to leave liberty out, not because I want to, but because I only have time to do two cases. But it's about the fairness argument about civil rights. The claim of this case is that when the um, Department of Homeland Security took people who had been here for decades, who were complying with orders of supervision, who were living out their lives in kind of normal ways, who have American spouses and American children, and long-standing equities in this community, even though they also have these previously granted decades-old orders of, of, of removal, when it took them and without notice to them, arrested them and said, and we're deporting you in three days, that it did something unfair. That under United States law, those detainees have a right to be heard on current country conditions that might render their removal um, unsafe in a variety of ways, that it might um, lead to their persecution or their torture. The majority of the 114, like about 100 at least, of the 114 Detroit Iraqi, Iraqis who are being detained are Chaldean, they are Christian. And what's been going on in northern Iraq, where the Chaldean community lives in Iraq, has been termed by the U.S. Congress itself to be genocide. I mean, so, so the stakes could not be higher for them. They are absolutely in deep trouble if they get deported. And they have a right under U.S. law to say, hey, maybe in 1988 we weren't going to be in deep trouble if we got deported. And so we didn't put on a claim that said that we would. But since 2014, when ISIS took over Mosul and swaths of northern Iraq, that's different. And we now need to be heard. And your hurry towards deportation is violating our due process rights. And so we will see what happens. But again, the effort in this case is to bring a civil rights idea, the idea of fairness, into an immigration system, which at its birth, the constitutional law, said, no, 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 we don't do that. But we've been watching the erosion of that exclusion of constitutional values from immigration for, for generations now, and push is coming to shove. And so I am really hopeful 
that um, will land somewhere good with all of that, and that the, those ideas, equality, liberty, and fairness, which are, um, will, will enter the immigration system, and the idea that's lying around like a loaded gun, plenary power, which at the start was about racism and foreign affairs, is no longer, hopefully, is no longer being allowed to serve those particular functions, it's being engrafted to serve other functions, and maybe it's time to unload the gun. And so with that, I will um, uh, thank you once again for letting me uh, present today. Thank you.